think that we have moved into an era in which morally questionable to morally depraved character traits are valorized. They are applauded. They earn people social credit. They earn people their social living. All right, welcome back everyone. This is Mind Matters. Today we have a special guest. We have Josh Slocum, who is the host of his new podcast, Disaffected. Josh, um, can you tell us really quick how to find how to find your stuff, what your social media is? Yes. So uh, you can find the podcast anywhere you get your podcasts. We're on um, iTunes, Spotify, Pandora, Rumble, YouTube. Uh, just look for Disaffected Podcast. Um, I think the search terms are still working themselves out a little bit because it's so new. Um, but I, I will say, yeah. yeah, I will say, um, I know that YouTube is, is very convenient for people and they like to find a lot of things through there. Uh, but if you find the show and you're interested in it, I, I ask please as a favor, um, subscribe on some alternative platforms like rumble because, uh, my show I predict will not last long on yeah. YouTube. I will run afoul. Uh, of their content because I'm anti SJW and they, they will get rid of it. So mm -hmm. I don't expect that it's going to have a long run there. Well, we will include links in the show description to your YouTube channel, your Twitter, and maybe, uh, maybe rumble, um, just anywhere to, to find you. So I will recommend right away that, uh, that all of our viewers, especially if you like this, uh, this show, um, well, our show and this episode to subscribe because, uh, disaffected is, it may be new. I think there. I think you've had seven episodes out so far, Josh. Correct. Yeah. And seven. they're they're all great. And it is my new favorite podcast. So um, I just want to just want to say that, Josh. When I found you, uh, I w we talked before the show, uh, well, previously, and I mentioned to you that from the trailer that you did for your shows, just about two minutes, I knew it was going to be good, and you didn't disappoint because we've been talking about this stuff for for years as Ilan was saying before we started recording. And it is so great to find someone that sees the same thing, sees what's going on. It's it's one of those moments where you, where you think, okay, well we're we're not the we're not the only crazy ones, or maybe we're not crazy. <laughs> um just did did you have the same uh reaction? Like how do you how do you yes. see Yeah. I just the fact that you guys got in touch with me, I hadn't heard of your show before, but of course I'm, I'm listening to it now. I'm, I'm through, I think two or three episodes and I just had, I, I get this sense of relief. Um, just, I go, <sighs> when I see, so, I mean, really, uh, mm -hmm. when I see somebody else who sees what I see, um, and what I see is we are living in a cluster B world, right? I assume that your listeners, well, maybe I shouldn't assume, I assume that your listeners and viewers are familiar with the term cluster B, or do I need to explain that? Let's just give a really brief rundown of it. I'm sure it'll it, jog some memory, jog the memory. If, right. Yeah. I, I think we're all talking about the same psychological subject matter, but we may use slightly different nomenclature. It has, mm -hmm. you know, some terms have, um, are useful in some contexts and not others. So cluster B personality disorders, this is an American diagnostic scheme. Uh, there are clusters A, B, and C. There are 10 personality disorders among the three clusters. I'm specifically talking about cluster B. These are borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, and antisocial personality disorder. And antisocial is what your viewers and listeners know as psychopathy or sociopathy. Mm -hmm. Some people, define those things differently, I use them interchangeably. So there is not actually a consensus agreed on definition. I'm just telling you that in my definition, when you hear antisocial, please also hear sociopath or psychopath. Mm -hmm. um, personality disorders are, as you know, and as I said in one of my episodes, they're kind of mental illness, I think disorder I'm a little more comfortable with, they're not like the kind of mental illness that that people generally think of. We're not talking about something like clinical depression, 
uh, uh, acute or long-standing anxiety. We're not even talking about something like schizophrenia when people are not in touch with reality and are actually psychotic. Um, this We used to call these personality disorders moral insanity. Um, and frankly, I think we ought to have a renaissance of that term. Mm -hmm. This is not, what we're describing are not people with an otherwise normal and stable temperament and emotional disposition who just happen to be temporarily afflicted with a strong depression, okay? It's, yeah. we're not talking about people who are normally easy to get along with, straightforward, stable people who are just temporarily handicapped by a bad bout. We're talking about people whose very personality, the very things that make them them, are fundamentally distorted. Mm -hmm. um, what, in my view, what binds cluster B together, as I said, there are four of them. And I, I think actually it's, it may be more accurate to talk, if, if we're gonna look at somebody and say, I think this person you know, has histrionic personality disorder or borderline personality disorder, um, I think it may be more accurate to say this person has a cluster B personality disorder mm -hmm. with strong features of borderline, narcissistic, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, people talk about comorbidity, um, but I think the root that you can boil this down to is cluster B and that people can be different combinations of flavors. Yeah, let me let me comment on that a bit because you mentioned the DSM is the American standard. So what they've done in what they've done, like what the WHO has done in the ICD, um, International Classification of Disease, they've gone to pretty much a five-factor model. So our, our listeners will be familiar with the, the big five personality tests. So you've got extroversion, conscientiousness, openness, neuroticism, and I always forget what the fifth one is. Um, but you've got those... I always forget what the first four, what the four that I've already said are. Openness, <laughs> conscientiousness, extroversion, extroversion. Agreeab agreeableness, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Yeah. And neuroticism, right. Mm. So Remember what, the acronym OCEAN. I ocean. got that from Dr. Todd Grande. Okay, great. So what they've done, there's been a lot of research on just how, um, how problematic, I'll, I'll borrow a term from the SJWs, the, the diagnostic mm. system is in uh in well it has been in psychiatry psychiatry for years because we have all these problems with with um comorbidity and a lot of researchers have have wondered well are we actually what are we actually measuring are we measuring something what's what's a can is there a better way we can be doing this so what um many researchers have found out is that a lot of these personality disorders it looks like a better way to or to to measure them and understand them is in terms of a almost like a dysfunction of one of those um, big five personality traits. And the way I've read it described, which I think is really good, is that there's an underlying personality disorder construct. Whatever it is, whatever causes it, there's an underlying personality disorder construct that manifests through the personality, through the... It's actually four out of the five big big five that they've managed to associate with personality disorders. So on the agreeableness um, dimension, they've used the word dissociality, dissociality for for a certain like dysfunction in that aspect of personality, and that's the one that encompasses cluster B. These are so th what they might call them is dissocial personalities. And then when you add, then you can tweak other personality um, features to get the different cluster B personality disorders. So if you up the extroversion, that's when you're going to get your histrionic Histrionics. personality, right? It's like the over emotional, like, um, look at and me borderlines. and borderlines. Yep. And then, but borderlines is also a, a negative affect. So negative affectivity, affectivity is the neuroticism dimension. So when you add some neuroticism in there, you've got uh, borderline, well, and disinhibition. So the fifth, the fifth, um, like personality disorder dimension that they have is disinhibition, which doesn't really fall. It, it kind of falls under like a um, a negative conscientiousness um, thing, but it's it's it, it's not totally. It doesn't it doesn't correlate perfectly. But that's how that's one it way does, to think of it. That sounds like it may fit under um, talking about uh, ex the extreme impulsivity. Yeah. Of the borderlines, uh, particularly, although uh, psychopaths as well sometimes. Right, and so, 
so that's one so that's one way of thinking of it that there's this underlying personality dysfunction and with this with this cluster it has something to do with their um well with i came into this through psychopathy so with psychopathy there's just a total deficit in emotion the capacity right. to feel cert to to experience certain emotions and and that has an effect on the entire personality and the way that people that psychopaths interact with each other because they don't feel and they can't feel remorse or empathy or and right. that's just it's laughable to them um to them people yes. are are just tools to be used and thrown away or destroyed We're if they don't see to that right which is that's funny all. because we objects which is funny because they're the NPCs. They don't really have anything really going on in them. It's that they're just like these um, psychopaths. One of the things about psychopaths is that they they seem um, like a, a cardboard cutout of each other. Like they're actually pretty similar. They don't have they don't really have personalities. Any personality they have is is usually just a, a show that they're putting on for others, and that's how they that's how they get the, that's how they get what they want is by pretending to be what you want them to be. I, I, that's, that's a really good point. I would say that I, I think I find it among all of the cluster bees as well. The, the interchangeability, mm -hmm. one of the things that struck me when I realized what was finally, what was wrong with my mother. And if you want, I can, I can tell the quick story of, of what yeah. brought me to these conclusions. But, um, when I started visiting online forums for children of borderline parents, particularly, I was immediately struck by the fact that almost all of the anecdotes that these adult children were telling could have been stories literally out of my living room in childhood, mm -hmm. down to the same phrasing. The, the actual words were sometimes exact duplicates. Um, they're, uh, you know, the cluster B personality, just, they're not all the same, but they're also, there's a fine line to walk. Um, there's a, first of all, there's a lot of apologia going on out there. Um, there are a lot of people who are making excuses, particularly for borderlines. There's an entire cottage industry out there that is, um, well, frankly, I think it's it's run by borderlines um, and, and they're flying monkeys and they're codependents um, that is trying to make borderline personality disorder into almost something cuddly. Mm. We just feel more than other people. We're just extraordinarily sensitive. We're not like psychopaths at all. In fact, it's it's almost a violation of our human rights to be put in the same psychiatric psychiatric cluster. Well, okay. Well, you know, there's um, or let me just get uh, interject really briefly. There is something to that because it seems like borderline has been. It's almost like a catch-all, and a bunch of people get included in borderline that probably shouldn't, or or at the very least, Correct. there are two different kinds of borderline, right? There are those who respond to treatment. There are those who don't. There are those who, um, how do they put it? Like have internalizing tendencies, which are more like the neurotic, um, um, self-destructive tendencies. And then there's the externalizing ones that attack other people. So it may actually be that, that, you know, there are some borderlines that, that probably, probably shouldn't be, categorized as borderline, but I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. There's been a lot of misdiagnosis um, and there has been overdiagnosis, but what, what mental health doesn't like to talk about is there's a lot of underdiagnosis too. Yeah, sure. Uh, a lot. In fact, at this point, anytime somebody tells me that someone they know has bipolar disorder, I immediately assume provisionally that they have borderline personality disorder until proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, it, it has served me well as a rule of thumb. This is so common. First of all, I mean, and this is not my opinion. You can go into the literature. That's an extraordinarily common misdiagnosis. Uh, someone mm -hmm. who's a borderline gets labeled bipolar. Um, doctors make this mistake constantly. Um, and in some ways, I think it's a, I call it a sympathy diagnosis um, because, well, we can talk about this, but stigma, right? Uh, everybody's worried about stigmatizing mental illness. There are a lot of behaviors that come from mental illness that I'm quite convinced need to be far more stigmatized than they are. And mm -hmm. that's part of the problem. That's part of why we're living in a cluster B world. Uh, there are some things that should be shamed. There are some things that are unacceptable. Um, but, you know, what borderline and bipolar share on the surface is is the the emotional ability the mood swings right but in most bipolar 
these take place over the course of days or weeks, whereas with borderlines, it tends to go by the hour, sometimes even by the couple of minutes, right? Mm. So if you've got somebody who's joyfully happy and, and seems manic to you one minute, and then five minutes later, they're crying hysterically, that's not bipolar, folks. You know, it's not necessarily borderline, but if there is a serious mental health problem, you know, we're not talking about somebody who's intoxicated or someone who's under an acute stress that has driven them right to the edge, right? That can make any of us into a temporary borderline, right? It's much more likely to be to be a borderline personality disorder case. Uh, but I agree with you that um, there's also disagreement over whether uh, the construct complex post-traumatic stress disorder um, which is not recognized in, in the DSM. Uh, there are people who are saying it should be recognized. There are people who are saying, no, it shouldn't be. There's some legitimate disagreement over whether borderline and so-called CPTSD are shades or degrees of the same thing or if they're different mm -hmm. constructs. And I'm, I'm agnostic on that. I, I see good arguments for both. Well, you mentioned- Sorry, we're getting a little abstruse yeah, yeah. probably. Yeah, well, let's, let's take it in a different direction. You mentioned the- extremely fast switching between states manic and well give give us an example because your first episode was your story how you came to to a, a realization about your mother and the effect that had on your life life changing well it affected your understanding of your your life until that moment and then it changed your life afterwards. Maybe you could give some examples. Well, tell us a bit about your story and maybe give some examples of exactly that, what that looks sure. like. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll try, I'm going to try to use a couple of pop culture examples that might help people frame this. Um, and I'm getting to the age now where I'm dating myself with these. So I'm sure that you've got some young listeners who are like, what is that? Look it up. I'll probably understand. <laughs> Go to YouTube and look them up uh, because you'll, you'll, you'll be glad you did. I described my mother as, if we're going to use movie characters, I described my mother as a cross between Joan Crawford in a trailer park, okay? Um, my mother is a poor man's version of Joan Crawford. She's neither beautiful nor rich. We were very poor, but she acted the way Joan Crawford did, both the real woman and the portrayal in the book and, and film Mommy Dearest, which of course is, is based on Christina Crawford's memoir, her daughter, uh, her adopted daughter. Um, a cross between Joan Crawford and the character Margaret White in the movie Carrie. You guys familiar with the Stephen King movie Carrie? I don't mm -hmm. mean the one in 2002, I mean the original from, from 1976. Sure. Religious fanatic. Um, my mother was not a religious fanatic, but um, she had she had that mercurial temperament where she would almost get high on her own anger and anxiety uh, and throw temper tantrums and throw herself around and scream at the top of her lungs to her children. Um, uh, my mother's a very frightening woman. Um, seven years ago, I, for my entire life, my entire adult life, I had been in a caretaker role with my mother. My mother did what is called parentification. Even, even well, even as a small child, even as, as, as a three or four year old, my mother depended on me for emotional support. Um, she confessed her secrets to me. She treated me like a, like a girlfriend, right? Like a confessor, um, like a therapist. Um, I knew far too much about her personal life uh, than any child should have. And I always felt that it was my responsibility to comfort my mother and let her literally cry on my shoulder and tell her, yes, mommy, we love you. You know, we'll, we'll never leave you the way, you know, all those bad men have left you. This is, this is how I was trained growing up. And when I became an adult, I haven't lived with my mother since I was 12 years old because she institutionalized me, um, um, when I was having a crisis and, and attempting suicide. Um, so I was taken out of the home by family court and I was placed in a, um, a temporary holding uh, evaluation facility. And then I was put into a group home uh, in New York State and eventually became an emancipated minor at 16 and, and went out on my own. I, I have not lived with my mother since I was 12 years old. 
And I'm in my immediate family, the first person to go to four year college um, to have a, a professional career. Um, so I tried to build a life that was above the, the poverty and destruction that I grew up in. But seven years ago, for my entire adult life, my mother has been calling me to solve every crisis. I have paid off back rent for her uh, so she wouldn't get kicked out of houses. I've put her stuff on moving trucks. I mean, we moved, a, a, I think I counted 10 or 11 times. We lived in, in different places and in different states uh, from the time I was born to the time I was 12. And my mother continued that. She would use up use up her goodwill, go not be able to pay her rent, not be able to pay her phone bill. Thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars over the years I've spent bailing my mother out of her own financial mistakes. And it got to a crisis point where she was going to be kicked out and homeless again seven years ago. And foolishly, I hadn't woken up at this point. You have to understand it was uh, I was still I was still in the cult of my mother. So I decided this is going to happen for the rest of my life. I'm the eldest of three children. I'm going to have responsibility for her as she ages. So I better do this in a way that makes financial sense. I bought a second house. I'm not a rich man. I work for a nonprofit. I make fifty thousand dollars a year. It's not bad for a single guy, but that's after 18 years and I live in the state of Vermont. So I, I don't have extra money. I, I was able to buy a house that was in foreclosure. It had to be rehabbed. I put $35,000 into the house uh, to rehab it. So that there were two apartments. It's a ranch, duplex upstairs and down. And I said, I'll move my mother in here. She'll live at below market rate rent and I will make the bills work by renting the second apartment at market rate. So I basically... I solved my mother's financial problems. I solved them completely. Um, she would never have to be homeless. I bought her two cars. I mean, I would never do this. I was very, very foolish. <laughs> Don't follow my example. But I, I, this is obviously a lesson I needed to learn. Within two years, I was contemplating suicide, which I have not done seriously since I was 12 years old. I have been a depressive with anxiety. I've been diagnosed with something like complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, whether or not that's accepted, I um, I think that's the root. Of, I mean, over over my life, I've been diagnosed with major depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, symptoms of Tourette's, uh, panic disorder. Um, and at one point in my life, it might have been it might have been fair to diagnose me with borderline personality disorder. Um, as I said in, in one of my episodes, I don't think that's the case now. My shrink now doesn't think it's the case, um, but these things get passed along. And my life was an emotional turmoil, um, like many children who come from this background. In the two years that my mother was living with me, um, everything was a crisis. Uh, her paranoia got, got intense, she, uh, things like, if the light was out on the porch, my mother would call me whatever time of day and night it was and, and, and be in, in, in apparent terror that intruders were going to get into the house and she wouldn't be able to see them and I needed to fix the light and I needed to fix it right now. I mean, it was small stuff like this. Other times she would, I'd get dozens of texts from her every day. She'd talk, she would spy on my neighbors, not my neighbors, my tenants downstairs, go through their mailboxes uh, to find out if they were getting welfare checks and then send me screeds about their filthy urchin children, as she called them, um, and, and how they were making her crazy and, and why were they ruining her life. I mean, it was just absolute insanity. And, um, you, you know, I would, I would call my mother or, or visit her and I could hear her in the background screaming at her husband. Um, call on the phone and and I'd talk to my mother and then I'd hear her turn around to her husband and say, get the fuck away from me. Get the fuck out of my living room. I mean, and I'm not exaggerating. I mean, this this is my mother's affect, right? Um, she, extraordinarily verbally abusive. Uh, and her husband actually has a congenital brain condition. He's not, in, he's not intellectually disabled. He was a newspaper reporter. Um, he's a, a competent, guy of at least average intelligence, probably higher, uh, but he does have vulnerabilities because of a congenital brain defect uh, with memory and concentration. It didn't matter to her. Get out of my face, you retard. I had a retard sister growing up. I didn't intend to marry one. So this is my mother. 
Um, and any, a normal person who did not come from a background like I came from would have put a stop, well, a normal person would not ever have moved his mother into the house, right? Mm -hmm. um, but anybody would see that this was insane behavior. To me, it was a regression to my childhood. It, I am, I'm an outspoken person. I'm self-confident. Um, I know the worth of my intelligence. I know the worth of my work. But around my mother, I'm a scared child. And I would cry and vomit and have diarrhea and be unable to go to work with migraines. Um, I mean, I, I would literally tremble uh, when my mother called. And at first I thought it was Alzheimer's disease or some form of dementia because she had these paranoid fantasies about the house being broken into and, and, and odd things like that that just didn't make sense to me. Now I know what borderline personality disorder is. And, and you know, one of, the, one of the criteria is transient stress-related paranoid ideation that certainly described my mother. Um, but we first, uh, my sister and I asked her to take a, a dementia test. Um, you can well imagine that she was not happy about that, but she did and passed it with flying colors. And I said, Jesus Christ, <laughs> it's not this. What is it? And then one day my sister called me and she said, Josh, I think our mother has a personality disorder. I think she's a clinical narcissist. And I started reading. And within two days, I had read very widely, as much as you can in two days. But I, I basically did nothing but read about cluster B personality disorders. And my entire world came into focus clearly immediately. Mm -hmm. I realized that I did know what was wrong with my mother all my life, but I did not know there was an, an epistemology to understand it. I did not know that there was a category to put it into. When I got the name of that category and when I saw that these character traits fit into this pathology, it was, it was literally like watching my life rewind and everything that didn't make sense, every, every, every plot line was tied up, right? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, and so to end that, um, um, I had to, she would not leave voluntarily. I had to evict her in court. I had to hire a lawyer. Um, and, and it was some bit of work getting my law firm to understand who they were dealing with. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I'm not a cruel person. Uh, um, I won't, you know, um, I want nothing to do with my mother. I will never have contact with her again, but I, I, I'm not actually cruel and unreasonable. And I voluntarily gave her twice the legal uh, statutory time limit to vacate my apartment that my state requires plenty enough time. Blew through that, blew through um, uh, court dates. We had to go to court many more times than was necessary. Um, and um, during this time, I had to get on top of uh, my mother and her husband's attempt to launch a professional smear campaign to um, take my job from me. My mother began calling my colleagues and uh, my mother is not unintelligent. So she knows about the concept of plausible deniability. So she would call my colleagues and say, I'm very concerned about Josh. He doesn't seem like himself because everyone in my life has always known that I've been on antidepressants, right? I'm afraid he may not be taking his medicine. Could you check on him? This was not concern. This was an attempt at a smear campaign. And uh, her husband, I began to be afraid for her husband's safety because my sister sent me screenshots of texts with my mother where my mother confessed that she wanted to break his head open. And she threw an iron skillet at him, hoping to crack his head open. It missed his head and it put a wall, it put a hole in the wall of my apartment, which my mother thought was hilarious uh, and did smile emoji, laugh out loud, la, 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 la. At least it wasn't his head, ha, ha, ha. Um, I was afraid she was gonna hurt him or kill him. And I called Adult Protective Services, um, which naturally did nothing. Um, and I, uh, one day when I knew my mother was out of the house, I called him because I wanted to rescue him. And I told him I knew what she was doing. I was afraid that she was going to hurt him. 
that I was there and I was ready to take him out of the house and take him to someplace safe if he wanted to. And he turned on me and um, became astonishingly vicious. I saw a sign of him I'd never seen before. He said I was crazy. He said that my mother was not abusive, but that I was the abuser. I was the narcissist. Um, and I, 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 I said to him, Ed, I, I've seen, I've heard the way she speaks to you. I've, I've, I see that she's throwing skillets at you. You know, what, you know, what's, what the hell is wrong with you, right? <laughs> and um, he said, um, I'm starting up my own independent newspaper and just wait until I do the story about the charity executive in Vermont who is um, a clinical narcissist, uh, shouldn't be trusted, um, is actually an abuser and um, is passing himself off as a guy who cares about charity. I mean, it was disgusting. And of course, none of that took, right? None of it took, but I was so scared. I was afraid, I was afraid that I literally thought it was my mother threatened to call adult protective services and have me investigated for elder abuse for not agreeing to run marijuana to feed her addiction for her. And I don't blame anybody right now who's getting a chuckle and saying, and you actually believed that bullshit because it is kind of funny. Um, but I did. I'm not stupid, right? I'm not stupid and I'm not, I'm not naive. But this is what child abuse that continues into adulthood will do to a person. I was so frightened. I was, I was emotionally back at 12 years old when I was literally institutionalized. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, was, that was the story of the divorce with my mother. And it was funny because the, the, the law firm, you know, they would do things like, well, why don't you give her another chance? Why don't you give her another month to vacate? And I finally lost it and I said, listen, I have tried to explain this to you. I have printed out stuff from the Mayo Clinic. I have given you books. I have explained to you what cluster B personality disorders are. You are not dealing with a normal range person. And one of the lawyers said, this is more like a divorce. And I said, that's what this is. That's what this is. This is a high conflict divorce. You have met these people before. They are the ones who smear their partners in child custody cases. Connect the dots. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's very frustrating. Um, no, it, it's in, it's intensely frustrating. It is because people and th and this is why. So so that's the end of that story. Very shortly after that, it became clear to me that I was swimming in an ecosystem that was nothing but cluster B. I've always been a partisan, I had always been a partisan Democrat, a hard leftist. I'm a gay guy, so I was, you know, for the welfare state and for civil rights and for all this. And of course, naturally I'm for civil rights, but uh, not in the uncomplicated way. Um, I was shoveling a lot of bullshit uh, for the political left and being used and, and didn't realize it. But I had, I was part of the so-called new atheist community. I'm sure you guys are at least passingly familiar with mm -hmm. the Dawkins set. Um, and that had become my entire social world. And it, mm. as I looked around me, I said, oh my God, all these people around me have the same psychology as my mother. And if they're not actually personality disordered themselves, mm -hmm. they're flying monkeys, they're enablers, uh, they're codependents. They're like my, my, my mother's husband, right? I was my mother's flying monkey. For years and years, my mother convinced me that my sister had a personality disorder. It was my sister who was the borderline. I didn't, I never paid any attention to the details of this. I thought, I didn't think personality disorders were real. That just sounds like a catch-all diagnosis. <laughs> oh, um, but you know, I, um, I carried water for my mother and fought my sister. We're good friends now. Uh, but you know, this is, this is what can happen. And, and, um, it, I could not ignore it any longer. And, and the straw that broke the camel's back was the transgender issue. Um, and once I woke up to 
once I woke up to the pathology in my family, my mother is, is one of a long line of cluster B. She's not the only one living in the family who has this disorder. Uh, someone in my family is, is actually officially diagnosed as a borderline with strong sociopathic traits. I think her mother was also a borderline. Um, and it was everywhere around me. And I saw a good friend at the time um, have her paid writing gig snatched out from under her uh, because she would not say trans women are women. And I saw her subject to a slander and libel campaign whose viciousness took my breath away. And I saw people that I had called friend, people that when I traveled, I had stayed at their homes and ate dinner at their table, people that I had shared rooms with at conferences, people that we had called up and, and consoled each other over the phone when there was a death in the family. I saw these people treating this woman, no, not treating her badly, taking sadistic, almost sexual pleasure in tormenting her and ruining her reputation publicly and getting her drummed out of magazines, a blog writing collective and um, persona non grata at conferences. And I just, I said, that's it. I said, I'm in, yeah, I have to get out of this. Mm -hmm. And, and I realized that I had been a cult member. This is a cult. Just because there's not a single charismatic leader does not mean that this is not a cult. I think it's time for us to revisit our definition of cult. Um, because everything that is descriptive of a cult is going on in the social justice world, even though there is not one single personality around whom they orbit. Mm -hmm. I've just talked for a very long time. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I will no. let you guys get a word in. It, it was your, it was your origin story. And so it's, uh, right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's what gave you superpowers. It's and, and it's yeah, to, to, to your, uh, your purpose. As uh, I say to people, Oh, stewardess, I speak borderline. <laughs> oh, well, you know what? That that reminds me of something. Uh, when we talked earlier, Josh, I was telling you about, uh, you know, one of my favorite books, Ponderology, Political Ponderology. And I read a bit to you. And I want to read something else here because this is uh, this is what made me um, recognize, recognize you not having, you know, heard, even heard not having heard what you had to say i knew what was i knew it was coming cuz i could see like that there was i could see that there was something to you um a good thing <laughs> and let me just read a couple passages here from this book and then i'll we can talk about them maybe and i'll i'll describe some stuff or explain it but uh first um this is written by dr andrew, andrew lobachevsky he was a polish psychologist he writes, I was once referred a patient who had been an inmate in a Nazi concentration camp. She came back from that hell in such exceptionally good condition that she was able to marry and bear, and bear three children. However, her child-rearing methods were so extremely iron-fisted as to be reminiscent of the concentration camp life she uh, so stubbornly persevering in former prisoners. The children's reaction was neurotic protest and aggressiveness against other children. During the mother's psychotherapy, we recalled the figures of male and female SS officers to her mind, pointing out their psychopathic characteristics. Such people were primary recruits. In order to help her eliminate their pathological material from her person, I furnished her with the approximate statistical data regarding the appearance of such individuals within the population as a whole. This helped her reach a more objective view of that reality and reestablish trust in the society, in the society of normal people. During the next visit, the patient showed to me a little card on which she had written the names of local pathocratic notables, leaders, communist leaders in, in Poland at the time, and added her own diagnoses, which were largely correct. So I made a hushing gesture with my finger and admonished her with emphasis that we were dealing only with her problems. The patient understood, and I am sure she did not make her reflections on the matter known to the wrong places. That's just a little anecdote to get to um, this next one. Um, the specific role of certain individuals during such times, and I'll explain such times afterwards, 
Uh, well, it's the times we're living in, <laughs> partially. During such times is worth pointing out. They participate in the discovery of the nature of this new reality and help others find the right path. They have a normal nature, but experienced an unfortunate childhood, being subjected very early to the domination of individuals with various psychological deviations, including pathological, pathological egotism, um, oh, I lost my spot. Pathological egotism and methods of terrorizing others. The new rulership system strikes such people as a large-scale societal multiplication of what they knew from personal experience. From the very outset, such individuals saw this reality much more prosaically, immediately treating the ideology in accordance with the paralogical stories well known to them whose purpose was to cloak the bitter reality of their youthful experiences. This is the narrative, the cover story. They very soon reach the truth, since the genesis and nature of evil are analogous, irrespective of the social scale in which it appears. So that last point there is important, that what goes on in a family, what goes on between a mother and her children, between a mother and her husband, and vice versa, all types of interpersonal relationships. The same dynamics go on at all social levels, whether it's a school board, um, you know, a corporate board, or a, um, a, um, a company, or a political party, or a social movement, or the government that controls an entire nation or empire. The same dynamics are at play. This is an illustration of two phrases that um, that people like us now, um, we may have an initial negative reaction to because they've been co-opted by the SJWs, but I, I'd like to ask people to rehabilitate them a little bit. This is an illustration of fascism begins in the home mm -hmm. and the personal is political. Mm -hmm. My thesis is we are living in a cluster B structured society and it is because it started in the home. That is where fascism and dictatorialism comes from. This is, um, this people do not, people don't grow up normal and then become psychopaths. That's not a thing. Mm -hmm. Not a thing. Doesn't happen. Yeah, sometimes people can get, have a traumatic brain injury uh, that, that really distorts their character, but these are the rare exceptions. This comes from the home, domestic violence. We are living in a society, we are in an, a domestic abuse relationship with the social justice left. And I would say um, more and more with the left generally, the mainstream nice left. Um, I take no pleasure in saying this, none at all. That has been my home my entire life. It's not anymore. Um, <laughs> and I understand why it's hard to see these things for people. I used to describe my, I, de I, I dedicated my, my book to my mother. I wrote a book um, 10 years ago um, related to my professional field. I work in um, consumer protection in a nonprofit. And I, I, I wrote a, a hand a manual of, of, um, of relevant consumer protection laws in the field that I work in. And I used to describe my mother as this incredibly strong, intelligent woman who had been through hell and back and had managed to come out alive, uh, had gotten out of an abusive marriage. I beatified my mother. I, I literally one time said to my <clears throat> best friend, we talked about this recently, and she said, this is a, a woman with immense patience for the person that I used to be, uh, and I'm grateful. I once said my mother, somebody, she criticized my mother many, many years ago. And I said, my mother is a saint. My mother is a saint. No. I needed that to be true because I could not face the reality. But it wasn't true. Um, and although I do not talk about him as much, um, my stepfather back then, my mother married a man and then had two other children by him. So we share a mother, but we do not share a father. Uh, she married an incredibly violent man. Um, I think he's I, I think he's a borderline as well, um, who beat the living shit out of me uh, during childhood. 
and my mother. My mother was also a victim. Um, borderlines are bo often both victims and perpetrators. My mother was severely abused as a child. She grew up in basically the North's version of Appalachian poverty in the 1950s and 1960s. You know, houses with only cold running water, uh, no bathroom inside outhouse. Um, two alcoholic parents, uh, a mother who had 11 or 12 children, nine of whom who lived, and her last children she was having in her mid 40s in the 1950s, right? Um, her father died when she was 11 or 12. They were both uh, extreme alcoholics and her mother was promiscuous and would leave the house, leave the children uncared for at the house while she went out to pick up men and bring them back home. So uh, it's not, you know, my, this didn't come from nowhere with my mother. Um, and the man she married tried to kill her. I watched him strangle her. He tried to kill her. And it, you know, people have, I don't know how this is for most people, um, but that, the, the, the damage that that man did doesn't loom as large for me as what my mother did because my mother was there before he came and, he, and she was there after he was gone. He was never my father, right? So I'm sure my brother and sister have a different emotional relationship to him and to that time, understandably. Um, but my mother's derangement was always there. That was always a constant. And um, I colluded with her self-pitying presentation to the world. My mother is the, the world's biggest victim. Mm -hmm. Everyone, everyone, her family, her parents, her siblings, her in-laws, her bosses, her friends, her lovers, all of them have been the worst people in the world. They have all done her wrong. They have all sold her short. She never did anything to deserve any of the treatment she got. This is how my mother presents herself to the world. But the fact is, my mother is a very damaged woman. She's certainly beyond retrieval, as, as most of them are. Um, if you are younger, if you know somebody, or if it's you yourself who has traits of, of borderline, histrionic, um, I have some of those traits. Uh, it takes a lot of work to work through them, and I still have to keep them under control. If you are young enough and you are of, I don't know what character trait it takes, and you are able to see that at some point the problem isn't everyone else, the problem is your behavior, and that you are inviting these problems into your life, there is a chance for recovery, for significant recovery. I used to say, I used to not believe this at all, was, you know, once a cluster B, always a cluster B. There is evidence that at least certain types of borderline and, and maybe some kinds of narcissism are amenable to treatment, but this is very, very important. I, just like I emphasize that Cluster B personality disorders are not analogous to depression. They are not amenable to treatment uh, as easily as something like depression is. And that itself is not always easy to treat. But cluster B is much harder. Most cluster Bs aren't ever going to get better because in order for them to get better, A, it ha they have to be reasonably young because the, our traits calcify over time. They harden, they become concrete. Um, and they have to meet a mental health professional who is very well schooled in trauma, very well schooled in, in um, character disorders and personality disorders and knows how to treat them. Most clinicians in my experience are not. Um, they're woefully naive. Uh, even those who have the best of intentions, when they approach a personality disordered client as if she were a normal range personality, not only do they not help her, but they often end up validating her derangement and, um, and, and helping to concretize that derangement because they fall for her bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. um, most of them are not going to get better. So I always say, if you are listening to someone like me talk about this and you have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, first of all, get a second opinion. Do you really have borderline personality disorder or do you have complex post-traumatic stress disorder? And again, I know that these are blurry, I get it. Um, 
some people are overdiagnosed or misdiagnosed. But if you do think that this is true, please seek help and be discriminating in your choice of therapist. Be honest about the problem and be ready to hear some very difficult things about who you are. It's very hard to hear that a part of your personality is deranged. But it's necessary to face the truth if you want to get through this. So I do encourage people, if, if you are, if you have enough of a constitution that you are that your ego strength is enough that you can bear to hear that you might have a personality disorder, you are so far ahead of most of them. And you have, you know, there's reason to hope that there's treatment there. But you know, as I've also said in my show, beyond that, um, I care about waking normal range people up because we are all dancing to these people's tunes. And because it's, it's, it's neither possible for us, nor is it our, our duty to therapize people like this, what we need to do is separate ourselves. We need to isolate destructive people with this character derangement and we need to take their power away. We need to set up boundaries. And I don't care whether it's in your household with your parents or with your husband or your wife in your political party. And, and unfortunately, a lot of times the cluster Bs win. This, we're not guaranteed to, to get away from them. Sometimes this means you have to cut your family off. It means you have to quit your job. It means you have to quit your political party. Yes, sometimes this means that you will lose it all. That's reality. Mm -hmm. And it's a reality that, I'm, and I'm sure you guys agree that a lot of people don't wanna wake up to. I'm sure that you know people like I do who are still telling you, it's just a few bad apples. Most most people on the left aren't like that. Or it's only crazy. It's only those real liberal liberal arts colleges. I'm sure you hear that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, what so, do you think? <laughs> oh, I I think uh, with voices like yourself, um, Douglas Murray, James Lindsay, uh, Jordan Peterson, you know, we now have a greater uh, voice to help identify exactly what you're discussing here, Josh. Uh, and well, and I there's-, there's... I, will, I will say really quickly that the reception to this kind of stuff, in my opinion, is a lot better now than it was 15 years ago. But part of that is because things have gotten a lot crazier since 15 years ago. But like, I, I'm talking about, like we were seeing similar stuff during the Bush years, and there was, there was some personality disordered stuff going on with, uh, with the, the whole war on terror and the politics of that time. But I think it's gotten so in your face nowadays that I'm fine. I'm finding at least there to be at least a little bit more of a, a reception to these ideas. It's kind of a, a counterbalance. It, it's, it's the worse things get the, the more receptive certain people get to it. Yeah. And, and the more people feel individually called upon by themselves to take it upon themselves to, underscore and define and help uh, make this more understandable. So, well, and how did you guys see this? What woke you guys up? Why are you interested in this? Well, like I, I said, for me, initially it was my interest in ponderology or not, not, not in ponderology in psychopathy and just like just weird, weird, um, abnormal psychology right i was like well serial killers are really interesting and there's and it just seemed like such a, a cool interest cool weird dark idea so that just got that got me interested and then yeah. um and then came ponderology so I, I read this book like 15 years ago and that put a whole other perspective on it that that, that there there's a whole political element to it and and it can explain all kinds of it will it has a, a hand in all kinds of stuff that goes on in human history and it's not just it's not just serial killers and it's not just um, abusive parents but that's a, a big part of it but there there are yeah. societal implications and and then that the the one of the main points that Lobachevsky makes is that psychopaths that want political power use ideologies to get it and the ideology is their political mask of sanity 
just like a psychopath has a mask of sanity when he is um like if he's a con man he, he he's coming across as a as a guy you just love he's fun to talk to you get along with him and you just find yourself giving him your money and you don't you don't realize what what's even happened until after the fact i got i got conned not hugely but i got conned by a a, a common um just like low low level low life psycho uh, on the street in a, in a town i used to live in he he got me to to pawn stuff for him and i thought i was being such a great guy doing him this favor and, and then afterwards i was like what the hell did i just do i just went in the pawn shop and he must he he stole that stuff what what the hell was i doing and i felt like yep. such an such an idiot afterwards but that that mask of sanity that il, that illusion of the, of whatever they want to show to you that is on the political scale, that is ideology. So when when this stuff started happening, when it started blowing up, when I first started noticing it was in the in the lead up to the 2016 election, and then everything that's happened up after that. Initially, initially, I was like, I was with the liberals. Trump is totally evil. He's he's Hitler. Things are going to go bad. He's going to bring fascism to the U.S. That's where I was. But then, but but before the the election, something switched, and I'm like, um. And luckily, I had people to, to to talk about this who were seeing the same things, and we were saying, "Well, wait a second, something's not right here." Um, and part of it was just the amount of the amount of um, opposition he was getting, and f- and from where he was getting it, the types of people that were that didn't want Trump in power. That that just that struck a. It, it was just odd, and then f- that kind of switched how how I was looking at the situation, and then and. I think part of I think that was important for me to then be able to see what all this stuff on the left because I was you know I was a I I like the way I put it I have a leftist personality high on agreeableness and openness it's like that's just where I naturally fit but um I started seeing how just absolutely crazy this stuff was the stuff that was going on in the universities Jordan Peterson getting canceled for for saying he would he 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 was against enforced speech um, like forcing people to to use certain pronouns and and made up words and i was just like what is going on here and luckily you know having read this book i had a framework was like well just wait a second this is exactly what lobachevsky talks about this is the exact this is um a a rhyming history this is rhyming history of what went on in in russia prior to the revolution what went on in china during the cultural revolution and beforehand there is something very similar going on and everything it's now, yeah, it ha- it's happening now. It's happening so, now. And, and the, you know, yes, yes. I mean, I, that, that sounds like the same uh, thought evolution that I've had too. I don't know how you, uh, you guys feel, but I, I still, um, it, it, it's, to me, it's perfectly obvious that yes, clump is clump. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's come down right. to. <laughs> I know. Um, uh, Trump, Trump to me is an obvious narcissistic personality disorder case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yet, yet he is not the evil tyrant that I was convinced that he was. Mm-hmm. That's, I mean, when I was able to, to calm the hell down mm-hmm. and stop emoting about Trump and start thinking about Trump, when you look at his legislative record, at his executive record, it's it is it does not support the idea that this w- this guy was bringing fascism in here. I mean, we're <sighs> Josh. I had every reason to hate Trump. I grew up in New York City. Grew up, you know, reading satirical articles about the man, uh, watching him promote himself, looking at all the crass buildings that he had put up. Uh, I just had a general uh, distaste for him and a, and a reaction, which I understand very well on the part of uh, progressives and, and the left. He is he's he's on a very vulgar. Uh, surface vulgar, exactly. You know, we used to call him vulgar. Spy Magazine called him a, a short fingered vulgarian from Queens. I was from Queens, so uh, you know when he when he was running for president, it was just like ugh. But uh, th- there was a journey there, and it was a rather uh, big one. I had already known about Hillary Clinton's. Uh, I mean, a, she's basically another part of it. Yeah, an arch criminal, right? And um, 
And so after a while, it became clear to me that even Trump's, you know, track record of, you know, swindling contractors and, and, and doing shady business deals with the Port Authority in New York City. Uh, I mean, basically, he was just a very, uh, what's a nice way of, of putting it? A, um, just a very smart businessman who did things that, that, that skirted the, the gray of, of doing business as a, on, on his level yeah. of, of legality. Um, but uh, similar to Harrison, the, the, the reaction, the demonization, the over-the-top um, labeling, the, hysteric, the hysterical responses. Russia, Russiagate. Uh, That's ba- one of the things that did it for me. Basically. And, and of uh, course, I, it's jaw-dropping. Um, so, so this I'm has been a journey. I was taken in by it. Bro. Well, uh, we, we watch the news and, and alternative media very closely. Uh, so we were able to see things and, and truths come out many months before they became more, more public. Uh, but I, I have to say that at some point, I think in 2017, I woke up to this you know, radicalization of, of the left because uh, I too consider myself left leaning or progressive. That was my that was my uh, um, my choice way of describing myself to to friends and others. I was a progressive. It's such a nice word. Yep. And and uh, and I, I realized we were living in a everything had had become inverted. Everything had become twisted and upside down. So even even if I had a a, a background. And understanding in in narcissism, uh, and in you know working on my own narcissism to the extent that I could, um, and and uh, dis um, dissociating myself from from people in my life who were toxic influences. Uh, I, the, what we were seeing was something that was happening on a on a on a level that I. I found I, I'm still, to be quite honest, looking at at the cancel culture and and all of the kind of uh, vehemence that's being projected and unfairly uh, foisted upon people, and it it's mind boggling to me. And I'm uh, I'm, uh, but I'm also the 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 good thing about it, the 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 pleasure uh, to the extent that you can call it pleasure, is to see how all of all of this. Um, all of this kind of madness uh, is, is in fact, a, at the very least, it's being used politically, but at the most, it's a political weapon to help bring in other much larger and damaging uh, mm-hmm. movements and, and, and changes that will ultimately not only injure and damage uh, the people who are fighting for wokeism, mm-hmm. but it's going to hurt everybody. It yes. is hurting yeah. everybody. So uh, it's been a remarkable. Uh, We're all going to be in the gulag together. Yeah, yeah. It, it is a totalitarian movement, and that's you were saying before. I think before we were recording, Josh, you were saying that um, that you've had people um, knowing your story and knowing your life and and looking what you're saying. Um, say that you. How did you put it? That you're like, like a one issue guy. You you you've got mommy issues. Like li, li, list all those things. Like what what are what okay. are people saying about you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then we'll talk about the feminists. Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah. <laughs> I've had people tell me that well. And, and it got to me for a while because there's always there's a grain of truth in the criticism. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do tend to be obsessive, right? Um, I think about this stuff 24 hours a day. I've thought about little, well, I have a job, I have a house, I have friends, I have kitty cats, you know, I have my hobbies and stuff. But I think about this stuff all the time and I have thought about it nonstop for five years and I'm not gonna stop thinking about it. Uh, and I'm not gonna stop talking about it because I'm scared. I'm scared for us. But I've been told I'm obsessive, that I'm a hammer and I think everything is a nail, um, that I'm projecting, um, that I'm, I'm trying to work out my own personal experience by projecting it onto the world. 
Um, and it's, you know, criticism, criticism, even when it stings, is worth examining because often there, often there's something to be learned from it, even if you decide in the end that it most of the criticism is unfounded, it is worth listening to your critics. Um, but I'm not gonna apologize for this. I'm I'm damn sure I'm right. Mm -hmm. I know I'm right. This is cluster B. I'm not wrong. You guys aren't wrong. Um, and and it it's caused such a rupture. It has caused me to re-examine every ideology and every philosophy that I have aligned myself with. Um, and I, five years ago, me, if he could stand there and listen to me talking to you right now, I would cancel myself. Okay. I would cancel myself as a bigot and an unreconstructed troglodyte, um, you know, all of these things. But the, like I, I said um, on my show, and I think I, I said to you, Harrison, when we talked before the show, the trans issue is what really broke my mind on this. This is the example of the big lie. I have never seen anything in, I've seen things on film. I've seen history, but in my life with my own eyes, I have never seen such a stunning lie. Mm -hmm. This is the entirety of it. Forcing people to say that men are women and women are men by self-declaration is the Simon Pure example of the big lie. And it is the demonstration of the fact that the content that you are being required to say makes no difference. We, we could be being forced to say that waffle irons are sea anemones right? Mm -hmm. Or something equally ridiculous. It does not matter what it is. Two plus two is, is five. Two yeah, plus two, two plus is two is five. Water is dry. Um, water, water starts fires. When the sun comes up, that means it's dark outside. <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is. The purpose is to demonstrate that you can be compelled to say nonsense because it is a demonstration of absolute dumb dominion and power over. I'm a, I'm a, I'm aesthetically offended. I'm morally offended. I'm emotionally offended um, by this. I, it's hard to describe it. And some of the people who, feminists, for example, and there are many different definitions of feminism. Mm -hmm. um, and I have friends who are feminists. Some would call themselves radical feminists. Some would call themselves liberal feminists. It's one of those, you know, oh, you're, you're only talking about da 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 I know it's a big messy category, but I am really tired of hearing that because I I I I am I'm very much against um, the transgender bullshit. Obviously, I think that everybody should be equal before the law. Nobody should be harassed. Nobody should be denied uh, a job. Nobody should be uh, fired simply because they express themselves in a way that doesn't comport with, with sex role stereotypes. I'm a gay guy, right? I was out there at the tail end of ACT UP, you know? Um, I remember when we had no legal protections as homosexuals. I still believe in those fundamental liberal values, but men are not women. And God damn it, you will not make me say it. And it is infuriating to me that feminists are responsible for a great deal of this because they claim you know, the people that I'm, I mean, I, I spent a whole show talking about the Trojan horse that is the Equality Act in the United States. It's basically going to strike out women's rights completely. The, and I'm protesting along many women who call themselves feminists and they, they are not connected to reality on this issue. They keep saying this is a men's rights movement. This is patriarchy. No, it isn't sweetheart, because just look out in front of you, count the people who are canceling other people, who are shunning them, who are calling their employers and saying, did you know that Josh doesn't know, doesn't believe that trans women are women? Do you really think you should have that kind of employee? Who's doing it? Women are. This is a white, young, liberal women's religious cult. That is what is driving trans. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. There are at least eight women for every one to two men who are go, go, trans, rah, 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 rah. I mean, it's just a fact. You can, I mean, you can deny it if you want, but everybody can see it. And I think that this is an example. This is like that species of cuckoo 
um, that uh, will go to a rival bird's nest and kick kick the, I don't know, the robin's egg out and replace it with a cuckoo egg and co-opt the mother robin into brooding the cuckoo's egg. That's exactly what's happened with feminism. These women, many of whom mean well, they're trying to out mommy each other in public for credit and for points with other women. This is a competition between women to see who can be the most saintly maternal type, who can care about trans women the most, who can be the most expansive. This is, it's competition. It's female on female competition and jockeying for position. And it is leading us down a road to hell. I am not denying that there are a lot of very powerful men who have this as their interest. There are some millionaires and billionaires out there, men who are, are putting their money behind these initiatives that are that are gonna destroy the legal foundation of sex-based rights, uh, which are important. I recognize that is true, but the vast majority demographically of the foot soldiers and the flying monkeys who carry it out are women. Women are doing this. Women are the ones who are driving cancellation campaigns. Women are the ones who are shunning people. It was women who came after me. I'm sorry, I, there's no way to talk about this without, <laughs> it, it, I find it so frustrating. Find it so frustrating mm -hmm. because and you guys know this too you won't yeah. say it but i'll say it and that'll make it okay you know that gay guys like me we mostly we have a lot of women friends right mm -hmm. lots yeah. and lots of women friends you know um i have always had more women in my life than men I, my confidants my mentors have been women women are very important to me but both sexes have in general in general both sexes have certain tendencies and certain traits, and these bring advantages and disadvantages. And the disadvantages with men, we're more aggressive. We are far more physically violent. If a murder is gonna happen, a rape is gonna happen, it's almost always a man. And some of the disadvantages of women is that their maternal reflexes um, and their their interest in preserving relationships, building bridges and mending them rather than burning them can be turned against them. And that is what has happened with trans. Mm -hmm. And what, um, and, it, and it's frustrating because women in many ways stand to lose the most. If the Equality Act goes through in this country, it will be illegal for a corner gas station. No, no, that's not a good example. It will be illegal. Let's go from, from small harms to big harms. It will be illegal for Macy's as a clothing store to have change rooms that are women only. They'll say women on them, but they'll mean gender identity, which means as a man, I can walk in and say, I'm a woman. Yes, yes, that is exactly what will happen. This is the legislation. Gender identity trumps sex. Okay, so that's just the Macy's changing room. What about the domestic violence shelter that's women only? Mm -hmm. What about the rape refuge for women and children? What about hospital wards? What about psych wards, right? What about your daughter's locker room in high school? Boys are gonna be able to just waltz in there and say they're women, it's already happening. You can see it in the news, it's already happening. Even it, it's happening ahead of this law. Um, and it's been hard to watch this and hard to fight it um and and still you know there there are a lot of people you know i'm losing friends right now as i i mean i whenever this plays i'm losing more friends right now i'm losing more women friends and and that 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 makes me sad but it is it is the case i think we need to get if we have any chance of overcoming this this constructed reality, the pseudo, -re the para, para reality, as James would put it, or as, as the author of Ponerology would put it, um, we have to come to terms with reality. And we have to come to terms with the tendencies of the sexes. And they are there. They're real. I don't care whether you believe they're socially inculcated or genetic or combination two. I do not give a shit. They're there. And we are being, our, our weaknesses are being used against us to further the aims of people who would see us either silent or dead, preferably dead. That's where this ends. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Josh, in, in this recent video of yours about the Equality Act, 
you speak a lot about language um, and you use a lot of critical thinking to break down how things are defined. Uh, and it's, uh, we just did a show on 1984, the film, uh, and discussed a, a little bit of the book and, and how Orwellian, how that's become a way of describing uh, how things are ac actually the opposite of, of, of the, uh, the real Reversal. meaning as we understand. Yes. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, the use of language and how, how these Orwellian twists have been put into certain definitions in the Equality Act a little bit? Yeah. Well, as I, as I said, in, uh, if anybody's interested, it's episode seven of my podcast, Disaffected, um, where I, I spend a lot of time going line by line through the Equality Act. And, and you know, honestly, I, what I'm doing should not be difficult for anyone to do. I am an intelligent guy, but I'm not, I'm not the most intelligent man on the face of the earth. I'm not the most highly educated man. I'm not doing anything that an adult of average reasonable intelligence should not be able to see. That's what scares me about this so much. Mm -hmm. You know, I appreciate, I appreciate what it's kind when people say, you know, you're, you're really right on target with that. Your analysis is great or you're very brave. I don't think I'm extraordinarily brave. I think that most people are surprisingly cowardly mm -hmm. and I think they've turned their brains off because I'm not doing high level shit here. I'm right. just reading English. And, and when I read um, you know, the definition section of the bill, which defines what sex and what gender identity is, it's literally a circular definition. Gender identity means gender related characteristics. Gender means gender. Uh, and sex is even worse because it's not even circular. It's, it's absurd. It's like, you know, sex means, um, um, AT&T telephone systems. I mean, that makes as much sense as what this says. Sex means gender identity. It means pregnancy. It means a condition related to sex. Okay, it just means whatever the hell you say it means. So first off, language is used to disguise things, but the reversals are the worst, the, euphemist, the euphemistic reversals. So when people talk about what trans is and what 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 medical care is for trans people. They don't want to talk about what it really is. Okay. On the milder end, on the milder end, it's merely poisonous cross-sex hormones that leave most people sterile. That's the mild end. Okay. But if you go for the full surgery on a man, it means slicing open the scrotum and removing the testicles and then slicing open the penis and peeling it back and inverting the penis. I know this is hard to hear. This is what's happening and making what I called a dead end flesh pocket. That is literally what this is. It is inverting the penis and making an open flesh wound that they call a vagina. This is what you're signing up for. If, And you know what they call it? Gender affirming care. Gender affirming care. Doesn't that sound nice? Doesn't that sound like something mommy would make for you to go to sleep at night? I'm gonna give you some gender affirming care with your Ovaltine. Ministry of love. This is sick. Yeah, ministry of love, ministry of truth. Um, it it's it's psycho. It is it is literally psychopathic. This logic is psychopathic. It, it reminds me the lies. Let me get, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a, a small example. Um, people talk about gaslighting a lot. And it's another one of those words that people like us now, like disaffected liberals, if you will, mm -hmm. um, we, we react against this um, because we rightly detect histrionics, borderlines, and narcissists constantly appropriate real things and wear them as a costume. Whatever anybody's getting attention for, whatever seems dramatic, they make that their identity. And thereby they cheapen and devalue the words to the point where people say, don't talk to me about gaslighting. That's just some SJW bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. We can't let them take our language. We cannot let them take our language. 
we have to be able to describe this and we have to be able to describe it in plain and accurate terms. Gaslighting is a real thing. Mm -hmm. Just because that gaggle of SJWs that annoy the shit out of you say the word all the time does not mean that gaslighting is now removed from our lexicon. Take it back. Gaslighting is not just lying. Gaslighting is lying or lying by omission or lying by embellishment in a system, a larger system that is meant to make you crazy. It is meant to destabilize your sense of reality and make you question your judgment. When I was going through the crisis with my mother, I, I was so gaslit by my mother that I started writing down things that I did and said on particular days so that if she came back in a week and said I didn't, that I'd, I'd have an objective record. I would call my friends and I would say, I just talked to my mother, X happened. Will you please remember this? because I'm so unstable right now that I sometimes, I'm questioning my sanity. I'm questioning if I'm hallucinating, all right? And I think many people watching this right now know that feeling. Mm -hmm. A stupid example, but, but, but chilling to me nonetheless. In the spring of, of 2016, a few months before the crisis with my mother, um, she told me that the toilet seat was broken and she asked me to replace it. And as the landlord, of course, that's my duty. I'm obviously, I'm gonna, you know, my tenant says the toilet seat's broken, I'll get it. Now, really? My mother could have put her lazy ass into one of the two cars I bought for her and gone down to Walmart and gotten a toilet seat herself. But really it was easier for me just to do it. So I went over, I bought a new toilet seat. I remember this so clearly. It's a stu, I mean, I don't remember why, but I remember it. I remember kneeling on the floor in front of the toilet. I was shouting to my mom who was in the kitchen in the front of the house. And I was saying, oh yeah, this one will fit. It's not the same color. And she's like, I don't care what color it is as long as I can sit on it. Da, da, da. I remember putting it on there. I remember taking the old one out and taking it outside to the recycling bin. Three months later, when the crisis occurred and I started eviction proceedings, I got a a uh, five page single spaced email from my mother at 4.30 in the morning. I suspect she was addled on Valley. I, what, I, what I didn't realize, and, and this, I started take, my sister and I repaired our relationship and you know, met each other again as adults and started comparing notes. What I didn't realize is that my mother has been a benzodiazepine addict for decades, Valium, Xanax. Um, so they're, you know, <laughs> the things people can hide, but she didn't, she didn't really need chemicals to be as crazy as she was. This is long five page letter where she accused me of being a narcissist. She, she said I was crazy. She said I was an abuser. It was, it was just, it was a stream of, it was a stream of filth. Um, it, and, and people this sometimes people have a hard time. Some people are very vulnerable to female cluster bees because they don't believe that women can be as evil as men. They can be, mm -hmm. they can be. They're not usually as physically dangerous. It, you know, you're right. I mean, if you're worried about rape or getting killed, it's most likely gonna be a man, but women can be just as psychologically deranged as men can. Sure. And, and some people had a hard time believing that a mother could say these things to her child, but they can. She literally accused me of being so cheap and mean and petty that I wouldn't even replace a broken toilet seat and that I was forcing her to sit on the porcelain. I mean, it, it, it just, it gets down to this granular level where she would, she would tell me that, that something stupid that we both stood there watching me do never occurred, never happened. And it just gets worse from there. It, it's like the riots that occurred, the Black Lives Matter riots and the Antifa riots that occurred in American cities, most prominently in Democrat governed cities around this country. The billions of dollars in property damage, the people who were, what was it, 25 people who were killed? Was it about 25 people who lost their lives in connection with these riots? I don't know if I have that figure accurately, but I think that's close. I'm watching people on the left say these things literally never happened. And if they did happen, we just saw a few examples of violence, mostly peaceful, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. They set police stations on fire. They set government buildings on fire. Mm -hmm. They beat people. They beat Andy No, the journalist. I think that actually took place before the uh, the BLM yeah. stuff. That was a, f a couple of years ago. But we we have people who are saying that these things we can all see did not happen, and if mm -hmm. they can't convince us that the videotape is is you know if if we show it to them on videotape and they have to say that it happened, they have to call it something else. They have to say that's not violence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen to this. You know, it's it's these reversals are are running <coughs> through this entire project. It's not violence. Words are violence. Saying that trans women aren't women is violence, mm -hmm. but actually beating reporters, beating people on the street is not violence. This is this is a really a really interesting, strange, and disturbing phenomenon. Um, I read a book recently uh, by I think his name's Stanislav Vizotsky. Viz He's an Antifa scholar. He's a sociologist. So this is, uh, I think this is the only academic book that's been published on Antifa. Um, it just came out okay. this year, I think. And his story is he is, he is a longtime anti-fascist. Like, so from the sound of it, he came up in the, in the Antifa, anti-fascist subculture, which was largely in the punk scene. Um, it was like this in the in the UK in the in the seventies, I believe, is when it kind of started, and then in the eighties, and it moved over to the states. And basically, there's a there's a honey pot. Well, yeah. So there's but there's so there's a punk scene, and there were. This is the kind of the, the legend and the story of Antifa, or at least American Antifa, that in or part of it, in the punk scene, there are the neo Nazis, there are the, the the white supremacy skinheads, and then there are the the anti fascist. Um, skinheads well they were skinheads in in uh, the uk but anti-fascist punk um subculture people and so they would be the ones like protecting a venue at a at a at a uh, at a concert um to to break up fights or to get into fights with fascists when they were there with the with the neo-nazis it was basically like a, this subcultural movement um you know a bunch of a bunch of kids listening to punk music or adults you know um who still listen to punk getting in fights at concerts and stuff and I think that was his yeah. background and it, it's let it's it's escalated from there but he gives a really good like rationale from the anti-fascist perspective you, you get an understanding okay these guys really don't like fascists but the two things that stick out not just in the book but in the movement and in the movement itself one he says anti-fascists reframe um self-defense they reframe violence so when when we when antifa attack people or um, are violent or destroy property, it is actually a form of self-defense because they've got their definition for it, right? Right. And, yeah. and, um, and that, that, uh, well, and so the, the, they're justified in violence because they are from their anti-authoritarian anarchist pr perspective, they are showing and demonstrating that the, the state shouldn't and doesn't have the, an author, uh, uh, a monopoly on force. And so they've got philosophical and, and um, historical justifications for their behaviors and their and their attitude and their ideology and their goals and their aims, whatever. Okay, that's all fine and good, but um, it's not all fine and good because the, a they're reframing something. Well, b who's a fascist? The definition expands to the point where anyone's a fascist. Now everyone everyone is a fascist because part of um, the Antifa ideology is critical race theory where everyone our entire culture is white supremacist So everyone can be classified as a fascist, but um, but that's not even what I want to talk about what they What what it is is it's a it's a justification for anti-social violence of an ideological nature now When you're reading it when you're listening to what they're saying it it can make sense and it does make sense it makes sense to my to me intellectually, and it makes sense to a lot of people just on a gut level when they're seeing it. But the way I've the way I kind of try to inoculate myself against that is because is it's absurd. Imagine a um, a a ruffian, a uh, just a, a thug, a guy on the street, like we've seen recently in the the uptick of attacks on Asian Americans. You see just some guy coming out of nowhere and beating the crap out of like a seventy year old um, Asian woman on the street. Now, that is reprehensible, right? 
everyone will look at that and say, okay, that's a that that's just inexcusable. That's a crime. That person should be punished. Um, for however however we think he should be punished, go to prison, get charged, whatever. But when that person is Antifa or a BLM activist, it's now all of a sudden it's ideological violence. It is self defense in some way. It is, a, it is a defense against the violence of the person that they are attacking. For some reason, ideological violence, revolutionary violence, gets um, gets into people's head as being justifiable, as being somehow different. When if you look at the personalities of the two different people, of the one person just beating someone up on the street for criminal reasons, and the other person who has an ideological justification for it, it can be the same person doing it. And that's the danger, is that it often is the same person person or the same type of person doing it, 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 it can still, it's, it's probably still an antisocial personality who is engaging in violence and is using the ideology as an, as a, a mask, as a, as a tool of getting away with it. Yes. This is, yes, yes, absolutely. I absolutely agree with you. And, and uh, this, this illustrates um, something else that I think is extremely important and that I, I, I wish people would think about more and that I would ask people to think about more consciously and monitor yourself and monitor your own reactions to these things and interrogate them. This kind of stuff is able to happen because culturally we Okay, so, so there's two parts. So I think that you're right that these are antisocial personalities. This, these, these movements like Antifa, these are, like I said, they're, they're, they're honeypots, they're traps for psychopaths uh, and antisocials. People need to know psychopaths and sociopaths, one of the defining characteristics is that they have a very high threshold for stimulation, okay? The things that would excite you or me sexually, um, food, thrill rides at an amusement park, they have to go three steps higher to get the same level of thrill that a normal person would get, right? So their impulsivity and their proclivity to engage in dangerous activities, they're trying to get a high and a thrill, right? That's part of the antisocial personality. Their, their tolerance meter is set very, very differently from the rest of us. This is a very handy excuse. There's a very simple explanation for this. It has nothing to do with ideology. It has everything to do with their personality disorder. This is how they feel alive. They need this level of stimulation in order to feel alive. And that is what makes them dangerous. And we allow this stuff to happen because I don't know if it's our cultural etiquette. I don't know if it's that more and more of us today have been trained by abuse tactics in our childhood. Um, I don't know what it is, but we have got to stop extending the benefit of the doubt to people. Mm. This is a particular problem for intellectual leftists. Um, I see this in, I'm not gonna name names here, but I see this and these are people I respect, okay? But they are very dangerously mistaken. Mm -hmm. I see this in some of the stars of what people call the intellectual dark web. Um, I watch people who can see so much of this, but who still have not broken out of this mental idea. They think that they're debating Christopher Hitchens or Richard Dawkins. They think that their moral duty is to quote, steel man the other side, give them the most charitable possible explanation because they are true intellectuals and they're not gonna straw man. They're gonna debate these things on their merit. You are getting sucker punched. And worse, you are getting me sucker punched. You are getting Elon sucker punched and Sam and Harrison and people around you. Stop this bullshit. Stop extending charity to these people. They're taking the intellectual high ground is a, is a merit in the right context, but it is a handicap in others. And you are showing your soft belly. You are inviting psychopaths to, to stab you and they're stabbing you and they're stabbing all of us. We have to discern between an intellectual opponent, an adversary in good faith, 
that we can sit on a debate stage and argue with and somebody who wants us dead. And most of the, not most, a great number of very good thinkers who are fighting the same fight that you guys are fighting and that I'm trying to fight are actually contributing to the problem. They don't mean to, but there are a couple of them out there and I'm sure you can think of them. Again, I'm not gonna name names, but there are several people who have been the victims of cancellation campaigns and have lost tenured academic jobs because of it, who are still calling trans women she. Mm -hmm. This is not a little thing. It's not just Josh's personal bugbear. This is serious. It's indicative of a serious handicap. This, we're past the time of respectability, okay? I'm not suggesting that people be abusive or dishonest at all. Mm -hmm. But the time for this tea party crap is over. Yeah. This is a fight now. And these people are bringing knives. Stop bringing your butter knife. Stop bringing your pin cushion. Stop bringing your tea cozy. Yeah. There is nothing inhumane about refusing to tell a lie. And when I see people who should know better, who are looking at a news story where yet another trans woman goes on a psychopathic rampage and axes somebody in a 7-Eleven mm -hmm. or rapes a 14-year-old girl in a UK bathroom or nails a dead rat to the door of a women's refuge in the Pacific Northwest. What is wrong with you? Why are you saying she, she did this? <laughs> it's, this, this bothers me so much more than most other things because it's so perverse. It's so perverse. You guys saw my the episode of my show where I talked about the attempt to morally rehabilitate the image of the fictional serial killer Buffalo Bill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, trans women saying even Buffalo Bill deserves her gender to be respected. <sighs> yeah. This is psychopathic. Okay. Yeah. This is psychopathic. You know what that reminded Stop me it. of, Josh? Uh, I want to say two things. One is it reminded me of all the women who had sent love letters to Jeffrey Dahmer to Ted in prison Bundy. Ted Bundy. and Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah. I, it's Thank like, you. Thank you. Thank you for seeing it. <laughs> it's like, what is wrong with you? What, you know, you're not understood. You're, I mean, all of these narratives for, for, for them pouring out their uh, attention and energy and focus on, on monsters. Uh, the other thing I want to say, yeah, monsters. Plain and simple. And, um, and even even if, you know, obviously not all trans people are monsters. I'm not saying that. No. I'm not saying that. But. Of course. It does not matter. It's not okay to tell lies just because this is the trans woman who you like. Or this is the trans woman who hasn't yet had a decompensating fit in front of you. Another thing people don't want to get to, what they don't want to admit. And it's not everybody. But in my view. There is nothing more cluster B than actually believing and being obsessed with the fact that you were born in the wrong body and that in order to live your life, you need to not only alter your body or you need to engineer your presentation and you need to engineer the politics around you so that your false self, self your mask, this narcissistic mask that everyone else says it's real. I call this Tinkerbell ontology. I do believe in fairies. I do believe in fairies. That's what this is. This is personality disorder stuff, okay? Extraordinarily high rate of cluster B personality. Trans itself, it pretty much sounds like a description of borderline personality disorder. And I do not mean this in a cruel way. And I do not mean to say that that means trans people should be mistreated. But this is a mental abnormality. It is not something to the extent that people need care. They do need compassionate care, but they need psychotherapy. They need trauma therapy. Many of these people are this way because they have been traumatized. Some of them have been traumatized in ways that, that abused children like me have been traumatized. It's not that I lack empathy for these people. Mm -hmm. Stop colluding with their mental illness. That's not the right way to care about somebody. And think about duty of care too. Sometimes what one person needs is in direct conflict with a similarly legitimate need of another person. We have to make value judgments. Why is the value judgment by default always whatever trans people say they need? 
even if it harms women, even if it harms children, even if it starts to normalize mutilating surgery, why are their needs more important than other people's? Sorry, I won't go on about that anymore. <laughs> no, that that was that was very enlightening. And and just one more point is that um, just referring to the numbers of very smart people or intellectuals or writers out there who have totally uh, lost the plot completely. Uh, there are websites that I, I won't go to anymore for any kind of analysis because of the, the sheer number of wrongheaded, um, deranged in some cases, uh, and just volumes and volumes of articles that are, that are mostly wrong or, or wrong too many times for me to to want to wanna have to sift through and pull my hair out to, to understand. Um, so yes, th there is like wrong uh, about like, what would be a, an example of the subject matter that you'd see that on? Well, it, it would be, so I kind of view a lot of the, 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 the racism and, and the, and the transgender issue and the, and the gay issues, uh, as, as part of a, an even larger set of issues like, uh, climate change and, um, and, and other things so that many of them get clustered together or allude one to the other, uh, where there is a, it's almost like, um, and I've said this before here on the show, there's a, a constellation of ideas that seems to be, well, if you believe this, then you believe this. And if you believe this, then you must believe this. And, and so, or you, the bundle. you know, you've got to take it all. Yes. It's a, it's a whole package of wrong that, that gets, you know, uh, you know, shoved into the back of your, your neck, uh, matrix style. Um, and it, it's very insidious. So, um, yes, we, we really have to, to, to parse out what people are saying. And I, I think the root of this, I think the way to boil this down to its core component, this, this is, like I said about other things, every philosophy, every stance that a person can take toward the world has pros and cons. It does some things very well and it has weaknesses that are just as pronounced as, as the good parts are good. So we have to be aware of those. We have to know when the system we're using, when the vulnerabilities in that system might be used against us. And one I would say that one consistent failing, and I'm not saying that liberalism itself is, is, is necessarily needs to be thrown out, but liberalism has a, a large failing and, and it's built in and it will always be a part of liberalism. And the failing is um, the inability or unwillingness to confront human nature for what it really is. It is an artificially rosy picture of the human psyche, okay? It, I call it Unitarian syndrome. OK, mm -hmm. you go to a Unitarian Universalist church, they're all extremely left. They're all extremely social justice and almost to a person, these people and, and many of them are very kind people. I mean, mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends who are Unitarians. I've sure. run in those circles a lot. However, they are desperately naive and desperately Pollyanna ish um, in such a way that they often put themselves and other people in danger. Mm -hmm. They welcome disordered personalities into their congregation and into the pulpit, and they are led around like the children before the Pied Piper. This is a problem broadly in liberalism. Um, I have come to the conclusion, I don't know, I don't have all the answers and my views are gonna change over time, but I do believe that there is such a thing that we call human nature. I can't describe it fully. I don't think any of us know it fully, but I believe it exists. We have a capacity for evil that is just as great as our capacity for good. And liberalism's problem is that it takes as a core assumption the stance that everyone is good deep down. Mm -hmm. Everyone is good at the core. No, they're not. No, they're not. Most people are fundamentally decent. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. I may change my mind. <laughs> but not everyone is good. Some people are evil. Mm -hmm. They are evil. 
And I don't care if that sounds religious to people. I don't care if that sounds metaphysical. We all know what I mean. There are bad people yeah. who at the very core mean you harm. Yeah. That is how they get pleasure. And until you face the reality that that is part of the human condition and that those of us who are probably fundamentally decent are capable of contextual evil, we are capable of cruelty and we are capable of being manipulated into hurting other people. Until we see that, we will be in danger. And I fear that that is part of what is allowing the wokeism cultural revolution to take over is people's absolute unwillingness to confront the reality of human evil that is right in front of their face. Right. And as long as, as long as we or society adopts this woke model where we see things in terms of sex or gender or um, race. race, as long as those are our most basic categories, okay, well, so you, you see where I'm going with this, with this, right? You've got, well, let's say um, good good minorities and, and bad um, white people, bad, bad majority, people. right? Then, um, bad straight people, bad white people, right. terrible so, men. So let's, say, so let's say we've got, well, it, it just, it, it messes up the categories completely when you say, well, what about a black psychopath? Okay, there's a white psychopath. White psychopath, black psychopath, Asian psychopath. Every culture, every race has psychopaths. You look at the trans issue. Okay, there's so there's such a push for for trans rights. As you as you say, like I'm all for basic basic rights for everyone. I don't think people should be discriminated against like for certain reasons. But when you when you take it to a certain level, at what point well I think I think I could get canceled for saying, "Well, what about a psychopathic trans person?" You know, what about a person who's actually who's actually a psychopath, but is just pretending to be trans because he knows he can use people, manipulate them, get them on their side, get them to defend him because nothing trumps being trans. What about exactly all of these, this, is, yeah. this is you you hear it when people say, "Here's the naivete. Here's the liberal naivete." Why would a man go to all the trouble and all the discrimination and all of the surgery and all of this, that, just so that he could get access to women and children? First of all, A, you have no trouble seeing it in the Catholic priesthood. You have no trouble understanding why a priest would go all the way through seminary just to get access to kids, a pedophile, right? You already accept that that is a thing that humans do. So first of all, drop the faux naivete because you're not being consistent and you know that you're not being consistent. Number two, what trouble? Like I said in my last show, what trouble? There aren't even any hoops to jump through to be a trans woman now. You don't, we don't have a scheme like in the, and the UK scheme is ridiculous. It's literally a rubber stamp, the gender recognition certificate. You are truly trans, the legal fiction they created. That's literally an administrative process that costs, I think about 75 pounds, maybe 150 pounds. There are no hoops to jump through. You simply assert that you are this person. So A, there's no hoops to jump through. There's no trouble they have to go through. All they have to do is say it. And, and this should be obvious to anybody, right? Predators will always, this is what predators do. This is what, um, and you know, all women know this, right? Women know that they need to keep their guard up at bars and sorority parties and frat parties and, and, and other places like that. There's always gonna be that guy who says that he's a feminist or he's a vegan or, or he loves animals or whatever it is that that woman feels uh, an affinity for, he's going to don that disguise. So, and in mild cases, so that he can convince her and maneuver her into bed, right? Or on the malignant end, so that he can get her into a corner and rape her, right? We already know that predators assume the camouflage. There is no better disguise than to do it in plain sight. This is why it should not surprise people that Many of the helping professions have a disproportionate rate of personality disordered people in them, social workers, um, sociopathic surgeons. Um, I mean, there, there are many examples like this. The best disguise is to become one of the, you know, to assume the costume of, of, of people 
that is why we should be skeptical of people who have reputations like pillar of the community. You know, how many times have you seen the woman who is on the Chamber of Commerce? She's on the Rotary Club. She's president of the JC Club or the 4-H. You know, she's got a list of charitable contributions as long as her arm. And then you come to find out that she's been embezzling from her company for 20 years and became a millionaire out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, substitute man or woman. This happens. So whenever we create a sacred caste, a a sacralized, a sacred identity. And right now, trans people have a cultural halo around their head. Um, black people have a cultural halo around yeah. their head. The people at BLM, that's a nest of psychopaths, borderlines, and narcissists. The people who rise to the top of that organization are the character disordered people. And it's not it does just not discriminate by race. And it's not just the like, and it's, it's wider than that um, because. Like, let's say I, I use the example of like a, a psychopathic trans person, but it's not just that it is, it is, it is woke because any psychopath can use woke ideology and just become part of the crowd because it's a very large crowd. It provides the anonymity. It provides the cover for these individuals to do whatever they want and what they want, like you put it is for, what for us to be silent or dead. They want power. This is what happens. This is what, yes. this is this is the historical example. This is what we can learn from history. What happens when this when this kind of process happens? These this a group like this will get power. They will get absolute power, and then they will use it to silence and kill a whole bunch of people, including the ones that supported them on their way up. That's exactly right. That's that's exactly right. The 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 good people, the normal range people who are who are deluded right now. I've been a deluded person. I was a cult member. I was a flying monkey. I I I don't sit in I I I'm not sitting in a judgmental position where I say I would never do that. I did all of that, right? Mm. I understand it because I've been there. Um even the good-hearted people are going to starve to death in the camp, whatever the camp is, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's mild disenfranchisement or your, your career options are so narrow that you're not welcome in this town again, or if we end up getting to camps, right? As soon as you are no longer a useful idiot, you will be chum. They will eat you. They do not love you. They do not care about you. And they will push you in front of the train. Mm -hmm. You will hurt too. So, you know, when people listen to people like us and, and I know, I, I know what my affect is like. I know that I come off as strident to people in many ways. I am strident. Um, I, I am afraid. I am very afraid right now. I'm afraid of what's going to happen in this country economically. I am afraid that we are literally going to lose our constitution and we are going to lose our first world freedoms. I'm genuinely that scared. Um, if the time is now to say these things and that person, I'm, I'm one of many people, many, many, many people are beginning to wake up to this. You, you all are, you've been awake to this longer than I have. You guys have, um, we are not the boy who cried wolf. Don't treat us like Cassandra. Don't. We're not doing this because we're getting a kick out of it. We, we're doing it because we're fucking scared. And, you know, when the shit hits the fan, it's not gonna make any difference how much of a cheerleader you were. You're gonna be sitting in the same camp that I'm sitting in. And the strident people and the ones who are, who are standing in the town square and yelling, you know, the red coats are coming we're not your enemies. We can actually be your best friend. We care and we can see it and we can help you see it too. Mm -hmm. We're not the enemy. Don't let them make us the enemy. Mm -hmm. Well, Josh, I think we'll end it there on your, on your show. You have a tendency to, to joke about ending on the worst note possible or the most depressing note possible. <laughs> so, but, uh, <laughs> but I think you, you turned it around there at the end. So, um, I think that's a, a good message to, 
to stop on. So we've we've ran a long time, but I, we've had a great time you. talking. No, it's been great, and I, thank you, and I hope we I hope we can do it again. Thank you for listening. To me go on and on and on. I I do appreciate it, and and just personally, I'm I'm so glad to meet you guys. It it does it does it does me good mentally to know that you're there to to make your acquaintance to know that you see what I see. Um, it's it's really a relief, and and it's a relief I need. So thank you. No, it's our pleasure. Thank you.